Omaha's news leader, chronicling the stories and people making a difference in our community. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Good morning and welcome to KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. I'm Weather Now Chief Meteorologist Bill Ranby. Today we're preparing you for the threat of severe weather. In this half hour, we'll take a look at how we forecast flooding. Our Weather Now Storm Team will answer questions, your questions about severe weather. And we'll also tell you the difference between different warnings and how to take a look at the importance of weather radios. First though, I thought it'd be a good time to take a look at the upcoming spring and summer season around here. Some things I'm thinking about, I really feel like the flooding issues are not over with. There is an El Nino ongoing in the Pacific Ocean. I really believe that cooler and somewhat wetter weather is more likely around here and that severe weather could be limited just a little bit. Let's talk about El Nino. El Nino is a pattern in the Pacific Ocean, the central part of the Pacific near the equator when it's warmer than average. That's typically called El Nino and it has an impact on weather conditions. It generally tends to cause a faster, stronger, active jet stream across the Pacific and into the U.S. That amplified jet stream pattern tends to bring us a lot of stormy weather. Of course, we saw that with record snowfall during February, and it appears that the pattern continues now into the upcoming season of spring and summer. It's not a guarantee, but this is the odds of the continuation of El Nino according to the scientists at NOAA. So May, June, and July, an 83% chance that El Nino continues. June, July, August, 77% chance. Even into the fall, a greater than two-thirds probability that we will continue to have an El Nino. That has implications on worldwide weather and our weather too. It tends to reduce tropical activity. Hurricanes tend to be somewhat limited during an El Nino pattern. But for us, we probably still have kind of an active jet stream pattern as a result, likely we'll continue to have issues with flooding here, stormy weather across the southern plains. And if you like dry weather, if you like hot weather, well, you probably got to go to the west coast as at least into the spring and summer, it tends to be a little hotter and drier there. The outlook, according to NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, for April through June is that it will continue to be cooler than average in the central states, warm in the west, warm in the east and as far as precipitation, maybe we continue to see a lot. There may be a couple of more blizzards to come across the Midwest. Mountain snow, rain here, but the outlook is for wetter than average conditions for the next 90 days for much of the country, including the Central Plains, Southern Plains, and only dry out here across the Pacific Northwest. One positive is that severe weather tends to be limited a bit. This is the incidence of severe hail and at least across the southern plains, it tends to be less frequent than normal and maybe more important, tornado frequency tends to be substantially lower than average across Tornado Alley here, the area from Texas on up toward Oklahoma, Kansas, and even on into Nebraska. So again, the key takeaways here, the bottom line, cooler and wetter conditions continue. Flooding on the Missouri probably will be a problem for a while and positively, maybe less than average severe weather. Well, you'll remember just last July in central Iowa when tornadoes hit Pella, Bondurant, and Marshalltown. Altogether, 19 twisters touched down, destroying homes and businesses and left behind a path of destruction. Luckily, there were only injuries reported and no deaths. That's likely due to the quick alerts that were sent out by meteorologists. Now, meteorologist Sean Everson is here to talk about the meaning behind those watches and warnings. Well, Bill, the first thing to take into account when we talk about watches and warnings is know where you live. The National Weather Service will base their watches and warnings on the county you're in. So whether you're in Douglas County, Sarpy County, or Pottawatomie County around the metro, that is the key information that you need to know going into severe weather season. And if you're outside the metro, whether you're in southeast, Nebraska, Gage, Pawnee, Richardson County, or in southwest Iowa, Montgomery, Taylor, or Page County. Know what town your county is in. Now, when we talk about watches, whether it's a Zephyr thunderstorm watch or tornado watch, the key thing about watches is that this is your time to prepare, to pay attention to the forecast. This is when a, a a watch will be issued several hours before we actually see any inclement weather when the conditions or the ingredients are there to promote severe activity later in the day or in the evening. Now, when we have a warning issue, this is your time to take action. 
Hopefully in the time beforehand, you have prepared, you have a plan of action in place. This is where if we do have a severe thunderstorm warning, we could have large hail, damaging winds or a tornado that's been indicated on radar or seen by a storm spotter. So there's something happening at this moment that is moving into your area. So it is your time to act and get to your safe location. Bill. Sean, thank you. You know, to track storms, we use our exclusive dual pole Super Doppler 7 radar. Meteorologist Molly Bernard, she's here to help us explain that. Yeah, so radar's actually been used to track storms and predict severe weather since World War II and dual pole technology. It was implemented in radars in the early 2000s. That gives us more information to help keep you safe. Midwest weather can change in an instant. And as the weather's changing, Having the best equipment is key to providing the best information. Conventional radar sends out one horizontal piece of energy. If it hits something, some of that energy returns to the radar. The energy that's returned indicates the intensity of the precipitation and the direction that it's moving. While all of that information is important, dual pole radar provides more. Here's the difference. Instead of sending out one piece of energy, Dual pole radar sends out two, one vertical and one horizontal. This gives us an understanding of what's happening inside the storm. Knowing the horizontal and vertical size of an object helps us determine if the system is producing hailstones, which are generally round, or raindrops that are shaped like ovals. Well, all of this purple area here is seeing the really strongest wind. In the middle of severe weather coverage, images like this are common. Red indicates the storm is moving away from the radar. Green indicates movement towards the radar. A couplet of these two colors can indicate a tornado, but the circulation doesn't always reach the ground. A pretty good green toward valley, pretty good purple going away. So that's a spot where, you know, it could spin up into a little brief tornado. Since dual pole radar measures the difference between horizontal and vertical size, when an object's energy returns to the radar with little correlation between the two measurements, it's likely that the object isn't meteorological. If this lines up under a velocity couplet, that indicates a debris ball. In other words, the radar is picking up on debris created by a tornado. Take the tornado that touched down in Bellevue two years ago. This spot is where our dual pole radar is saying this isn't rain, uh, this is debris in the air. With dual pole super Doppler, it was clear that a tornado was on the ground in a neighborhood and causing damage at that very moment. So this is our radar telling us that there was some tornado debris in the air. All National Weather Service forecast offices have a dual pole radar, but the National Weather Service radar in Valley only puts data out about every three minutes. Our dual pole super Doppler provides the Weather Now team with continuously updating data during severe weather. And you may have actually seen dual pole super and Doppler radar in action last week when a round of strong and severe storms moved through the area. That's right. You know, we're looking at hail, tornadoes, winds, all of that. Molly, thanks. Coming up, our Weather Now team answers your questions about severe weather. Plus, a look at how we forecast flooding in the metro area. You're watching KETV Newswide 7's Chronicle. Welcome back. With all the flooding in our metro area last month, and of course it's not done yet, our flood forecasts have been critical. To take a look at how we get that information, here's meteorologist Matt Surwey. Thanks, Bill. And each one of these little dots represents a flood gauge on a river or waterway monitored by the USGS, the U.S. Geological Survey. And if we zoom back out, our river forecasts actually come from the Missouri River, Missouri river Basin Forecast Center in Kansas City. And outlined in black here, are all the hundreds, hundreds of river gauges they monitor as we go throughout the entire year. And you can see that we still have a lot of water to deal with coming down, especially after seeing a blizzard in parts of Nebraska, South Dakota, and into Colorado and Wyoming. So how do they make these flood forecasts? Well, it's made at one of 14 forecast offices across the country. They use about 14, uh, 48 hours of forecast rainfall in their uh, computer models, and then they estimate the runoff and the water movement as they move downstream. These forecasts run every six hours for three to five days for every single one 
of those gauge locations. Other factors to account for snow cover and potential snow melt. We saw that in full effect last month with the severe flooding around here. Groundwater and soil saturation as well as frost depth as well as reservoir operations and we see that all the time with Gavin's Point Dam releasing more water. So flooding safety is a big concern around here as we anticipate more flooding through the spring season. Heavy rainfall can lead to rapid water rises in low lying areas. Look at how much water it takes to sweep a person away. Only six inches of moving water, 12 inches of water will carry most cars away and 18 inches of moving water will carry away a large vehicle or SUV. So as you saw that car do our best advice turn around. Don't drown when you encounter water covered roads. Matt, that is great advice. Thanks so much. Uh, it's so important and we've said flooding is probably not done yet so, for, so far this year. Now let's get some of the questions that you sent us through the KETV Facebook page. Um, I'll just say, Sean, you go with this one. All right, so first one, who determines whether we're in a slight or a moderate risk for severe weather and how accurate are they? So those outlooks are produced by the National Weather Service Storm Prediction Center. So they'll issue some of those out to about a week, but really focusing on today, tomorrow, and the next day. So day one, day two, and three. So there's several different categories. Like we saw last Wednesday, where we had severe weather across southeast Nebraska, a portion of the viewing area was under an enhanced risk. And sure, we saw late in the evening, those storms started to fire up, producing large hail through uh, over Beatrice, out towards Lincoln. So more often than not, I, I think that they are accurate. And as we get closer to events, they can adjust where they put the bullseye for severe weather. Right. And just because you're at a slight risk doesn't mean that you're going to see, see severe weather mm -hmm. or it doesn't mean you won't see a tornado. I mean, it's all possible, but we try to categorize them. And I think uh, you're right. They do mm -hmm. a great job with that. Molly. Well, the next one. So why are there crawls and alerts on the TV anytime there's a new weather alert? I think simply the alerts, that beeping, it's to grab your attention. If you walk away from the TV, there's bad weather. We want you back at the TV watching what's going on. And the crawls, they give you a little bit more information. So it's if it's a severe thunderstorm warning, it'll tell you where that warning is, how strong the winds could be, and even how big the hail is. Yeah, and I think one of the things that uh, sometimes people will, will see or not see is, you know, well, that crawl isn't impacting me. But, you know, Matt, that's one of the things that uh, is important, right? Exactly. We cover a large viewing area. One of the questions we get, well, why are you breaking into coverage when the storm's you know, over Red Oak and not over Omaha? Well. Mm -hmm. We cover several counties that go all the way from Norfolk down to Fairbury and over to Clorinda, Iowa and up toward Carroll and everywhere in between. So we have a duty and actually an FCC obligation to cover severe weather through that entire area because in some cases it's emergency, it's life saving information. So just because it's not happening over you doesn't mean someone else is being impacted. Right. It's a big viewing area. All right. Here's a, an interesting scientific question. So many people are looking at clouds. What are wall clouds and funnel clouds? And quite simply, it's kind of a, a, an area underneath the thunderstorm where the air is rising the most rapidly. A wall cloud is just the visual reflection of a very strong updraft. And as meteorologists will tell you, the stronger the updraft, likely the stronger the thunderstorm and the more uh, intense uh, updraft will produce large hail. Uh, very, very strong winds and possibly tornadoes. So we're so focused on those areas and storm chasers are too. So they're looking for wall clouds, lowered bases uh, underneath a thunderstorm cloud. Then the funnel cloud would be the extreme uplift that's going on. And if it happens to spin and rotate a funnel will form. And of course, if it contacts the ground, then it's a tornado. Mm -hmm. Molly, I see the next one up here for you. Oh, Sean, actually, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, so you were talking about storm chasers yeah. and, and trying to locate a funnel or a tornado. How dangerous is it to chase storms? Well, it's 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 dangerous anyway. You you look at it, um, especially if you're going in without radar or other meteorological tools to know exactly where a storm is and where it is heading. So uh, most most times, the the folks who are doing it professionally or doing it for research, they've got radar in their a vehicle where they're at so they can precisely uh, place themselves in a place where they can see the storm but at a safe distance or a, a position that is away from where the storm is moving so if, you, if you're going in to a storm thinking well I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get to the middle of it where it's worse well you could drive right into a hail core and just get pounded with baseball size hail or Absolutely. put yourself in a life-threatening position where you could be in the path of a tornado that's more right. third. And you just saw the video there of the Marshalltown, Iowa tornado where it came through. Uh, and, and sometimes even chasers get into bad situations and they can get hurt and we've seen fatalities. Of course, we hate to see that, but uh, it can happen. 
All right, Molly, Molly, I see you up here. Yeah, so someone's asking, why do some storms have hail, some don't, some don't, and then what causes that hail? And I think the first thing to answer is what causes the hail. And like Bill was saying, a strong thunderstorm needs a really strong updraft. So what happens is a little piece of ice goes further up into the atmosphere. It's covered in water that freezes, and then it goes back down, and then the updraft pulls it back up once again. So that's what causes the hail, and sometimes you don't have it just because the thunderstorm doesn't have that strong updraft. Yeah, and you know, other factors go into it, but uh, you know, it is a complicated process, but, uh, but good explanation of the hail. Matt, I see you have a question here about severe weather. All right, this is one of my favorites. It's, it's why does severe weather strike at a specific time of year in Omaha, like the College World Series, for example? Uh, well, the, the peak months for severe weather in Omaha and Nebraska and I was May and June. So statistically, we see the most uh, severe weather in those oh. times. I think a lot of people just latch on to those big moments, those events like the College World Series, maybe a birthday, Father's Day weekend, Memorial Day weekend, Fourth of July. And you just remember the weather on those days just because they're so momentous. So severe weather can happen at any time of year. It happens the most in May and June. It doesn't always have to happen during a big event. But in Omaha, we have so many events around here yeah, if it's outside in May or June, chances are it's going to be impacted by some sort of storm. Absolutely. You know, it's like people talk about, oh, it's tournament time. There's always a storm mm -hmm. uh, in a snowstorm in the springtime or in the wintertime. And, you know, you're talking about, well, you've got state swimming, you've got wrestling, you've got basketball. I mean, you've got a lot of, a lot a lot of championships <laughs> going on there. Odds are sometimes it's going to be hit. This is one of the things you're right. People remember the big events. Mm -hmm. All right, this is uh, an interesting one. We've talked about lightning and what's safe. Is it okay to have your computer and TV on during a thunderstorm? Is it okay to use your cell phone? And are there any activities you should avoid during a storm? Well, this is a lot. Can you roll back down here for me? Anyway, uh, when we talk about what's safe to have on, as long as you're not touching the electronic device, it's safe. Is it okay for your computer if your house get hits by light, gets hit by lightning? It may fry your computer out. Uh, same thing for a television. Now, you're not holding the television, so it's good, it's fine to be watching television, but realize that if your house get hits, gets hit by lightning, it could you know, possibly damage the electronics, that and the computer. A lot of people have computers, and if you're wired to a mouse there, there could be some danger there. Uh, is your cell phone okay during a, a severe thunderstorm or if there's lightning? Yeah, I mean, a cell phone, I don't have one in my pocket here, but you're not <laughs> holding anything connected to a wire. Uh, is it okay to be talking on a regular landline phone? Fewer and fewer people have those, but that might be a problem. And, and because if lightning hit your house or near your house and it traveled through the wires, you could be shocked or injured. Uh, and then finally, uh, shower, bath, no good. No good during a, an electrical storm because, again, if lightning strikes your house, uh, electricity can travel through the pipes uh, and impact you if you're into water there. So that would be a big problem. Sean, I see one here. Yeah, before I get to that, though, I'm going to touch on uh, lightning again. That, uh, well, it's a good thing if you're inside when thunderstorms are coming in because the best advice is, well, when thunder roars, head indoors. Because yeah. if you're on at outside during a thunderstorm, you know, even if it, it may be sunny or you see clouds in the distance, those lightning strikes can strike farther away right. from the actual parent storm. So even if you think, well, it's, I can see some sunshine, I'm okay. Well, that's not the case. If you can hear the thunder, the storm is close enough. And of course, you may think, well, maybe I'm out on the golf course enjoying a nice day and you see a storm coming in. I'm gonna go head under a tree. That's the yeah. exact opposite of what you yeah. wanna do. If you think about it, yes, trees are tall and usually the lightning will strike the, the tallest uh, thing around you. If you're out in the field and you've got a tree, it strikes the tree, you know the, the tree has a root system. So even if you're under the tree protected for, from the rain, well if that lightning strikes the tree, it'll travel through that root system. Mm -hmm. If you're staying on that wet ground, you can get hurt in that instance. So um, continuing on about severe weather safety and, and, and more about severe weather, we have a question, does humidity play a role in severe weather? In short, yes, it does. We, when we talk about the ingredients for severe weather, you have to have a moisture source, you have to have instability, a lifting mechanism, and then wind shear to prolong uh, that storm. Now, when you talk about humidity, well, uh, if you just look at the humidity number, you need a little bit more than that. Because sometimes, you know, when it's a, a cooler day and you've got rain out, it could be a cool day. You can have 100% humidity, but we're not necessarily having severe weather. Well, if we've got a heating source and we've got a warm day, temperatures in the 80s, and we've got uh, dew points in the 50s, 60s, even 70s, we've got that humidity up, and that can uh, contribute to severe weather happening. Uh, during you know those peak heating hours of a summer afternoon. Absolutely, and that's probably the, the, the age-old question that meteorologists get. Why do you talk about dew point when at the humidity? Because the humidity is relative. It's a relative mm -hmm. humidity. It's, it's 
comparing the temperature and the dew point. The farther apart, the lower the relative humidity. Closer together, the higher it is. The dew point is just a number. It's the amount of moisture in the air. So the higher the dew point, really, the more moisture for storms to occur and, and possibly cause problems. Molly, I see you up here. Yeah, so someone's asking what the likelihood of a large tornado hitting the metro is. And unfortunately, there's just not a great answer to that. It depends on the storm system, where the storms line up, where the frontal systems are. And of course, we'll keep you updated days in advance if we think that's going to be a concern. So it's something you just need to be weather aware. Keep an eye on the forecast with days leading up to a storm and especially the day of. If a tornado forms, we'll be able to see it on dual pole super Doppler and we'll give you the information you need. Good, good advance, uh, good advance uh, notification and good advice about that. Matt, uh, we've recently, I mean, it was a couple yeah. years ago, yeah. there was a water spout that a lot of people saw. What's the difference? All right, water spout versus tornado yeah. or that water spout in Lake Manawa that just sat there for about 20 to 30 minutes. Well, a water spout is a tornado that forms over water. If that would have moved over land or vice versa, it would have been a tornado on land. But it's literally the same mechanism, tornado on land, water spout on water. Yeah. And uh, in our area, I mean, there's a lot more land than water, so yeah. it's a fairly rare occurrence, <laughs> but it did happen and it can happen. All right, uh, question, what marks the start of severe weather season? Well, I mean, I guess we could say, right, last Wednesday, we, we had some severe storms around the area. But typically, we're thinking any time from mid-April through mid-July is, you know, say 90% of our severe weather occurs. And, and Matt, as you said, it's not that it can't happen other times of the year can almost any time of the year, but our peak months are May and June and then uh, to a lesser extent later April and at least the first half of July. And of course, we do get thunderstorms later into the into the season, but they tend to be more heavy rain or lightning producers than they are severe weather producers once we get to August and also September there. Uh, Sean, here's a, here's a tough one for people, right? Oh yeah, why does Omaha usually fall on the line between heavy snow and some snow? We've seen this over the last couple yeah. of years. We've had blizzards to our northwest and blizzards to our southeast, and just this past winter, well, Omaha finally was in the middle of one of those blizzards, so it all determines on the, the storm track of the system. Each system is unique in its own way, so it, sometimes it just happens that way where we're right on the edge and maybe 20 miles west we get, you know, six or eight more inches of snow or just to our southeast we get a foot of snow compared to an inch here in the metro. Yeah, I mean, it really all depends on timing and location. All right, coming up, how important are weather radios? Uh, they can be there when electricity is out, and of course, uh, they give you helpful information. First. A reminder that your comments are an important part of this show. If you want to be heard, email your comments to news at KETV.com. Remember, we love hearing from you. We'll be right back. Welcome back to KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle. We always put an emphasis on weather radios. They're a helpful tool when there are severe storms in your area. The radios are activated based on alerts and counties that the user has programmed into the unit. They just need batteries, so when power is out and your TV can't turn on, or if your smartphone has died, the radios can give you critical information. Our Weather Now Storm Team will help you program your weather radio. We have events set up at Metro Area Bakers this coming spring, May 11th, May 18th, June 1st, and June 15th. You can call the 7 Can Help line for the most up-to-date information on times and dates. And at any of these events, you'll be able to pur purchase a radio and have us program it for you for free. And of course, social media. It's a great tool during severe weather, especially when you're not by a television and storms are threatening the area. We have several different ways for you to stay up to date. You can download the KETV mobile app for the latest weather alerts and live radar. You'll also be able to find your hourly and seven day forecasts. And you can follow our Weather Now team Facebook and Twitter pages. Each meteorologist has their own page. You can ask questions and get the latest updates whenever there's a weather threat. Remember, if you missed any part of this show or want to watch it again, it's online right now at KETV.com. Just go to the home page and click on there and look for Chronicle. I'm Chief Meteorologist Bill Ranby. Thanks for watching. See you back here next Sunday morning for KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle.